there's anybody you can trust about masculinity, it's definitely me. Usually around this time, I would be dedicating a video to LGBTQ plus representation, but I kind of want to take the eye that I use on those topics and focus it on something different. I'd like to talk about positive masculinity in film and television. Now, you're probably more familiar with the term toxic masculinity, and this is basically going to be about the opposite of that. Before we get too far into it, though, I feel like I should address toxic masculinity at least briefly, just so that folks understand what it is I'm contrasting against. Because this is absolutely not a there is no such thing as toxic masculinity video. So let's back up and talk about what toxic masculinity is. Actually, hold that thought. First, let's sidestep and establish what toxic masculinity isn't. It is not the idea that masculin masculinity itself is inherently toxic, but rather that certain traditionally masculine traits can present or be depicted in a way that is harmful, destructive, and feeds into larger issues that as a culture we're trying to work on. Things like jumping to violence as the go-to solution for problems, lashing out at or rejecting anything that appears to diminish one's perceived manliness, which is at the root of a great deal of homophobia and transphobia. Also, there is sexually driven possessiveness, being protective to the point of stifling the very people that you are meant to be protecting, i.e. the dad with a shotgun, and much, much more. The ultimate case in point example in media may well be the villain of Mad Max Fury Road, Immortan Joe. Joe himself and the culture that he has built around him is the very embodiment of toxic masculinity. He views his wives as his personal property. He has raised a generation of young men to embrace a self-destructive warrior culture where they find glory in their own deaths, even though those deaths serve no one other than Joe himself. I mean, why do you think the vehicles all look like this? It's sacrificing practicality for manliness. Oh, and a quick side note, yes, there is such a thing as toxic femininity, and it does show up in entertainment. Just take a look at Fatal Attraction or Mean Girls as prime examples. But the reason that doesn't get talked about in the same way as toxic masculinity is that traditionally feminine traits cranked up until they become flat out harmful is virtually always depicted as a bad thing in these stories. Whereas, masculine traits taken to a level of toxicity have oftentimes been depicted in a positive light for a very long time. Immortan Joe may be the villain now, but if you ever go back to some of the early days of, say, James Bond, you will find yourself watching a callous, self-destructive man drinking his way through a life of empty sex and casual murder, and it's all shown to be awesome. Until relatively recently, this was laudable behavior more often than not. That's why we talk about ma toxic masculinity in general, which in turn is why I feel it's important to highlight the other side of that coin. Oh, and um, just in case anybody is wondering, I do actually like James Bond movies. Most of them. Anyway, it, it's just an easy example. Now, to try and bring it back on track, many of the traits at the heart of toxic masculinity, protectiveness, physical strength, defense through violence, the use of force in general, self-sacrifice, etc., these are not inherently bad things. They just get amped up to the point of becoming toxic, but all those same characteristics can be used and shown in a way that highlights their positive application, and that is really what I want to do in this video, because you can have a positive masculine character without stripping away the traditional masculine traits of strength, protection, defense, stoicism, etc. And I want to thank my Twitter followers for reminding me of some really stellar examples when I sort of put the call out on there. Sadly, 
I'm not gonna be using all of the suggestions that people floated at me. Many of them were more along the lines of straight up subversions of male heroes because they actually lacked many of the standard male heroic traits. Examples of that would include Newt Scamander and certain incarnations of the Doctor. Now, these are great characters and very valuable as we need male heroes who display more than some rigid list of manly traits, but that wasn't quite the angle I wanted to take in this video, so they're not going to be brought up again. There were also some amazing real-life examples offered up, but doing my due diligence on real-life people is a bit more work than I feel like I'm fit for. So we're sticking with fiction today. Also, additionally, and finally, if the actor or the writer behind any of the examples I'm citing is a problematic figure separate from the character in question, I'm not getting bogged down in that. Not today. That's not to say that it should be ignored in the grand scheme of things, only that for this video, I'm just talking about the characters and leaving as much baggage out of it as I can. Cool? Cool. So let's start big with the paragons of superheroes, Superman and Captain America. Now, both these characters have been around for a very long time and have been reinterpreted often enough that things have gone off the rails for both of them at a few points. I'm not going to dwell on those instances because that's not what we're here to talk about. I just want to acknowledge that I am aware <laughs> that that's happened. Now, both of these men serve as the ultimate role models of what heroes, particularly masculine heroes, should be in their respective universes. They are the ultimate moral authority, to the point that usually the best question anyone can ask themselves is, what would Captain America do? What would Superman do? Because both obviously are strong, and that may even be their most prominent superpower is raw strength, but more importantly, they serve first and foremost as protectors. It is not a coincidence that Cap's weapon of choice is a shield, and that one of the most iconic images of Superman is him standing in the path of bullets. They'll apply force as needed, but they do it in service of protecting others. That is what they're here to do, and violence is not the only means of protection. Both men are capable of great feats of inspiration. At their best, they make the people around them want to be better, and both are capable of great empathy, because there's more to protecting people than just standing in the path of physical danger, and there may be nothing better that exemplifies this than this page, which Mike Gillis of Radio vs. the Martians podcast reminded me of. While I said I wouldn't deal with real-life figures, I'm going to bend that slightly by talking about the film that does depict real-life events, but I can sleep at night because I'm only talking about the events of people as the film shows them and not delving into the actual true reality. At least that's what I'm going to tell myself. Apollo 13 follows the 1970 space mission that went wrong and the scramble of the astronauts and the NASA team on the ground to get the crew back to Earth safely. This was a situation where panic on either end, either the people in space or the people on the ground, could have spelled doom for the crew. What's great about this is it is a positive depiction of standing strong, moving forward, and not getting overly emotional about the situation, and it's about an entire team of men doing it individually and collectively. It's not about one man who needed to get the job done. If any one of the men involved had not stepped up, the whole thing would have failed. It's both stoic strength and team unity wrapped up in a terrific package. I'd heard similar praise about the recent Ford v Ferrari, but I haven't seen that movie yet, so I can't actually delve into it too much. Now, the TV show Brooklyn Nine-Nine is actually a cavalcade of positive masculinity, probably best embodied by Sergeant Terry Jeffords. He is the ultimate papa bear, built like a piece of construction equipment, but never afraid to be soft. He's a loving father to his daughters, possesses immense strength, but rarely actually puts it to violent use, and is both an authority figure and a booster for everybody else in the precinct. In the same show, we have Captain Holt, who is masculine stoicism and emotional suppression because, remember, boys don't cry, 
taken to an absolute extreme, yet in his own way, he shows repeatedly to, that he cares deeply about the officers under him, and his mannerisms aren't an affectation to hide his emotions. That's truly just how the man is, and that's okay. Even Jake, the quintessential man-child, is often an example of positive masculinity. Normally, this kind of character is detrimental to a group dynamic, constantly undercutting authority for no reason other than for their own amusement and jockeying for top dog position. And frankly, they tend to be big, stupid jerks who the audience is supposed to love because of reasons. And while... Jake has his moments of accidental problem causing. His playfulness is carefully balanced to not interfere with his work or get in the way of those around him. And when it does, he owns up to that and takes responsibility. It's why his relationship with Charles is so important because that gives him an outlet for his enthusiasm that could be more of a problem if it was completely unbridled. He's a genuinely positive example of the man-child. He may have to focus better at times, but he doesn't need to grow up in any big grand sense because he's a good guy, just the way he is. Jake will actually work nicely as a transition into masculine characters who shed toxic elements over time. Jake didn't really need to do too much of that since he doesn't exactly start off awful, just a little too self-absorbed. However, there are some characters who are clearly on the toxic end of things who discard the worst of it over time. This can happen in movies where a toxically masculine lead softens by the end of the film, the hard-drinking, emotionally stunted Eddie Valiant from Who Framed Roger Rabbit is a solid example. But the thing about movies like that is it usually happens right at the end and we don't get to see how this reformation actually plays out and practice down the line. So we often see the points at which they become better men, but so rarely get to actually see how life is actually better for them as a result. And that is why I freaking love Steve Harrington from Stranger Things. I won't lie. Steve is the actual impetus for me to do this topic in the first place. So yeah, I'm going to give him a spot of prominence. Season one, Steve, is a straight up creep. He's a violent bully whose possessiveness of his girlfriend is just ridiculous. And honestly, I was kind of shocked he was allowed to live through that first season. But oh, I'm so glad he did because his journey from high school top dog douchebag to world's greatest babysitter to amazing ally is just the best thing ever. And a big part of what I love is that it's not stripping him of the traits that made him such a tool in season one. It's just redirecting them. Steve is a guy who's more than willing to throw a punch and can be protective to a degree that spills over into possessiveness. So season two hands him a baseball bat, gets him invested in protecting Dustin. Same willingness to use violence to protect what he cares about, redirected to positive use. And then there's the scene in season three where his co-worker Robin comes out to him as a lesbian. This scene is seriously one of the best things I saw in 2019. They're, if you haven't seen it, they're both coming down from a truth serum, or more accurately, they are crashing. There's a clear chemistry between them, and it's obvious that Steve has himself a little bit of a crush. And then she tells him that she's gay. And it takes him a minute, but he pauses. The wheels turn, he processes, and then he shifts seamlessly into, tr into a traditional male buddy good-natured teasing role. He doesn't freak out. He doesn't have to question himself or his understanding of who Robin is. He just took in the new data, pivoted slightly, and kept on moving. Season one, Steve could never have managed this, but season three, Steve does it with ease, and that character journey is a thing of magic to me. Now... Most of the examples I've been giving so far have been from relatively recent pieces of entertainment. But lest you think that there was no positive masculinity before the 2010s, please consider the specimen of Rocky Balboa. What makes Rocky special is not his ability to dish out or inflict violence. I mean, 
he can do that. And the film makes it clear that isn't why he's ro he's worth rooting for. And it isn't really something he enjoys doing anyway. The reason Rocky's a hero is because of his resilience. Not because of how much of a beating he hands out, but how much of one he can take and keep standing on his feet. How many times he can get knocked down and get back up and do it all over again. The sixth film in the franchise actually had the character himself say it best. The world ain't all sunshine and rainbows. It's a very mean and nasty place, and I don't care how tough you are, it will beat you to your knees and keep you there permanently if you let it. You, me, or nobody is gonna hit as hard as life. But it ain't about how hard you hit, it's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. That's how winning is done. That's incredibly masculine, but it's not destructive the way active violence is. It's admirable because he won't let anything beat him down. Not Apollo Creed, not everyone telling him he's too stupid to make anything of himself, not even life. But here's my favorite part about Rocky, especially in that first film. Being strong doesn't mean not feeling or not showing emotions. So much of media over the years reinforced the real men don't cry, you have to put your feelings aside, get the job done. And they just reinforce that by example, if not explicit statement. But what does Rocky do at the end of that first fight with Apollo Creed? He calls out for Adrian. He bellows out his need to connect with his emotional core. At this, the highest moment of his life so far. And it's not weakness, it is triumph. And in a similar vein, John McClane, specifically as depicted in the first Die Hard movie. Now, He's got some traits that might lean towards the toxic end of things, especially when we learn a little bit more of the difficulties in his marriage. But what I want to highlight is that McLean is not an emotionless machine taking down the bad guys. He's scared. He's hurt. He needs support. He can't let the bad guys know this for obvious reasons, but the audience gets to know. We get to see this badass who's been single-handedly taking out well-armed, well-trained group of killers, he leans on a practical stranger for emotional support. He and Al have connected as men in a dire situation. McLean's need for emotional support is not shown as a flaw and it makes him no less of a man. And Al supporting him, even opening up about his own damage in order to do that better and be a better support, it's a complimentary display of strength through vulnerability. It takes a special kind of bravery to admit that you need help coping and to reach out for it, and it is wonderfully displayed here. And we can reach even further back than the 70s or the 80s. How about Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, where sheer pig-headed stubborn rigidness is put to positive use by having it supporting a strong moral center. Perhaps Henry Fonda as juror number eight in the classic 12 Angry Men, using every technique he can muster from pleas for empathy to cold hard logic to stand against wave after wave of vengeful opposition. Or how about the defiant demand for equal respect from the legendary Sidney Poitier in the heat of the night? And heaven forbid we forget the amazing Atticus Finch in To Kill a Mockingbird, stoic, stalwart, protective, crusading, stands his ground in the face of mounting odds, a man to admire for the ages. I could probably keep this going, but I want to hear from you folks about some of your favorite examples of, t of positive masculinity, because I guarantee there are some prime examples I have not touched on. So, next time that you start to worry that all men in entertainment are either depicted as bad or have been retroactively painted as such, just remember, there are plenty of role models out there, past and present, and to whatever degree masculinity is part of your identity, I just hope you'll keep it positive. Thanks for watching, and I encourage you to do the usual things, the likes and subscribes and sharing of the video. It helps the channel grow and keeps the algorithm from forgetting about me. If you want to lend a true helping hand, you'll find a link to my Patreon in the description. 
it'd be greatly appreciated, but I won't tell you what to do because I'm not that controlling. And besides, you're the council. I just run the meetings. Until next time, this council is adjourned.